Well, it's good to be back with you guys. Uh, we're back in our equipping class on the Beatitudes. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at the second Beatitude today from verse 4. And let me read Matthew 5, verses 3 and 4, just to give us a little bit of context. Okay. Verse 3 of Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So a brief recap of the first beatitude. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poverty of spirit, as we learned last time, is the doorway into the kingdom. Without it, you can't be blessed of God. You can't enter the kingdom. You can't be filled with the fullness of God's blessing Unless, what? You're empty first. And this is humility. This is repentance. This is really just an accurate view of yourself before the true and living God. And for seeing that reality in your heart, being convinced of it by the Holy Spirit's work in you, what happens? Well, you're blessed. You're blessed of God. You are immensely satisfied, joyful, happy in Jesus Christ. All right? So that's poor in spirit. Now, this idea of blessedness, we didn't cover this last week, but I wanted to kind of come back and touch base with all of you on this. It's a concept that a Jewish audience would have been very familiar with. All the way back in Genesis 12 and the Abrahamic covenant, it contains several blessings for the nation of Israel, and then it ends on a note of universal blessing through the seed of Abraham, Genesis 12, 3. So not only blessing for one people, but blessing for all the families of the earth. Deuteronomy 28, the Torah, the, the law, ends with covenantal blessings and curses. Blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And if you remember Psalm 1, right, in the life of a believer, a life of an Old Testament saint, they were blessed for delighting in the law of the Lord. And that delight showed up in meditation, meditation on the Word of God, not When it says law there, it's just saying teaching, instruction, not just the Mosaic law, but the whole counsel of God revealed up to the point of the writing of Psalm 1. So the writer of Psalm 1, the the person described by the psalm, the blessed man, was blessed in not living for sin, right? But instead in meditating on God's word all throughout the day. It was his delight. It was his treasure, his joy. And because of that, What did he find? What did he get, if you will? Well, he found that he was happy. He found satisfaction in the Lord as he delightfully meditated upon his word. The blessings to be enjoyed in God, whether it's back then or now, are for those who are spiritually redeemed by God. It wasn't just for anybody and everyone. Just because you're in Israel doesn't mean you are, in a sense, blessed. Right? At least you're not ultimately blessed. Now, there are all sorts of physical blessings and even just spiritual blessings that are given to you by virtue of, for Israel by virtue of being in the covenant community of God. But they weren't blessed in the sense that we would consider blessed, like ultimately blessed, right? eternally blessed. That blessing, the true happiness and satisfaction and flourishing of the soul that only a believer knows are for those who have been spiritually redeemed, saved people. See, Israel in the wilderness, if you think about them, they, you know, they, cr- they were uh, redeemed out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They were saved physically. But the entire first generation, what did we find out about them from the law and then from Hebrews? We found out that though they saw all these miracles, number one, and though they heard the good news, they knew the gospel of God in promise form, right? Looking forward to their deliverer and their Messiah. And they knew that God was their savior, that God was the only possible hope, their deliverer, right? the one that loved them and wanted them to be his people and for him to be their God forever and ever. What did they do? They heard it, but it was not united by faith in their hearts. And so they fell away from God and they all died in the wilderness. If you look at Hebrews 3, 12 to 19 and Hebrews 4, 1 to 2, it clearly tells us that. So blessedness is only for those who believed back then in God's promise of salvation. That God was their deliverer. God was their savior. And he would bring them a Messiah who would be their suffering servant, who would give their life, who would be crushed in his head, uh, crushed, uh, who would be, sorry, crushed on his heel, 
bruised on his heel, but would crush the serpent's head, the one who brought in sin. If you didn't believe that, you weren't blessed. You were blessed in a temporary sense, but not eternally, okay? Now that blessedness, of course, for them, and especially for us now on this side of the cross, is through from Jesus Christ. As you look at verse 4 of Matthew 5, you have to keep in mind another uh, a background reality. Another Old Testament background reality, actually. And the background is this. It's found in Isaiah 61, 1-2. And that's a servant song. So Jesus is singing this song, and it says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. That's the gospel. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and freedom to prisoners. He's not talking about physical prisoners. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. What's he talking about here? The Messiah, who would have the Spirit upon him, has been set apart by God to preach the gospel and to take the gospel to all of these different types of people who really define one people, the humble, the needy, the poor in spirit. Who are they? These are believers. These are his people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. And he would be the one that would fill their mouths. He would be the one that would comfort them and save them and purify them with his grace and mercy. And now we know that Christ, because he has come and he has died and he has, rose, he has risen and he is at the right hand of the Father, seated. And so blessedness comes through Jesus, which means the kingdom of heaven comes through him, which means mercy, satisfaction, seeing God, being called sons of God, a great reward in heaven. They all flow through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. And since we are in Jesus Christ, by faith, we are blessed. Okay? We are blessed. Now... With that in the background of our, uh, of our understanding of this text, look at verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who are sad. <laughs> right? Just like the kingdom of heaven is for the poor in spirit. Rich are the poor. Poverty of spirit is the, uh, was considered, uh, uh, Thomas Watson said it was the jewel of poverty. Now here, you're blessed for mourning, for you will be comforted. Now what does that mean? Okay? What does it mean to mourn and why does that bring about a blessedness? Well, let's start with this, what it doesn't mean. Now, this is Roman numeral number one on your outline, what it doesn't mean to mourn. It doesn't mean mourning over trials. Not that that's wrong, that kind of natural sorrow and sadness, which is just a part of life. That's not what Jesus is talking about in this context. How do we know? Well, because of the rest of the Beatitudes and the Old Testament context that we just mentioned, Isaiah 61, 1 to 2. The mourning there in the context of those chapters is not about like physical suffering. It's about the devastation of sin, the, the, the mourning over sin and its consequences. And if you look at uh, previous to the Sermon on the Mount, the, the opening sort of words of Christ in terms of preach, his preaching ministry was what? Was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 17. So really, the Beatitudes show us what a life of repentance looks like. Those who have repented look like this. Secondly, it doesn't mean being morose about yourself. What I mean is, Christ is not talking about being excessively down on yourself, always being sad about how bad of a sinner you are. That is not the gospel operating in you. Often, that's just a, a false humility, really disguised, disguising or cloaking self-righteousness because you're just focusing on yourself and you're drawing attention to yourself and, in, and it's really a form of self-pity which is pride. So it's not mourning over trials, it's not being sad about yourself as the worst of all sinners. But what does it mean? It means this. This is number two under Roman numeral number one. It means having genuine sorrow over your sin. That's what it means. And it could be mourning for personal sins, and you have a list of verses there, famously, Psalm 51, right? Or it could be mourning for corporate sins. You see that often uh, throughout the Bible where someone is lamenting the sins of God's enemies, lamenting the sins of the nation of Israel, lamenting the sins of a church. Paul does that as well. Paul calls the Corinthian church to mourn for their lack, uh, their negligence of dealing with a sin issue in their church, of not disciplining that, that person who's sinning uh, openly. So the spirit of true mourning over sin, uh, let me give you a couple of verses here. James 4, 9. Be miserable and mourn and weep. 
There's the word there, right? Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. In a context talking about uh, resisting the devil, submitting to God, and the context about uh, being friends, friends with the world means you're at enmity with God. And the reason why you get into quarrels and fights is because of your desires, your lusts inside of you. You want something, you don't get it, and so you will murder, you will fight with people. And you've asked before for these things that you think are good and you're not getting them, James says, you're not getting them from God because he knows your heart. You have bad motives in asking for those things. You just want to spend it selfishly on yourself if you get the answer to that prayer. And so James says, be miserable over your sins. If they're not light, don't, be, don't treat them frivolously. Weep over them. Mourn over them. Do you understand what kind of a condition you're in? And then Psalm 119, 136, notice this corporate mourning. My eyes shed streams of water, or mourning for other people's sins, if you will. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep the law. That's not corporate in the sense that the psalmist is weeping over his own sins. He's weeping over the sins of his enemies, but a text like Ezra 9. There, Ezra sort of leads the nation of Israel as they've returned from their exile for their sins. He leads them in prayer of confession, and he weeps in humiliation in torn clothes for the sins of the nation all right even though some of those sins he did not personally commit okay mourning in mourning there is a genuine brokenness over your own sins against god your spirit is in according to joel uh, the, the book of joel it's rent it's ripped it's not an external thing per se you don't have to cry necessarily instead of tearing your clothes your heart is torn your heart is weeping, not just, and this is important because of the consequences of sin, not just because you know, the, the, of the guilt that haunts you, that immediate visceral emotional response to sin, but the brokenness is there because you've sinned against God. You, you see that now, and it pierces your heart that you've done that. Acts 2, 37. Remember the first Christian sermon at Pentecost? They heard the gospel. They realized they put... Jesus, the Messiah, their Messiah on the cross, they crucified him, and they were pierced in their hearts, it said. And then they repented, and they turned to Christ in faith, and they were saved and baptized. You realize that you've grieved the Holy Spirit, whom he's placed inside of you, Ephesians 4.30. You sinned against God by pursuing the lies of, the, of our idols, the idols of our age, the idols in our hearts, because we believe that they were somehow better than God, more satisfying than God, and that God was somehow lying to you and holding, holding back some good from you. You realize that you, you, know, you, you despise the blood of the cross that purchased your soul for some, you know, you, you've despised it for some created thing that promises some gratification. The Bible says that sinning, sin, is committing spiritual adultery against the spouse who created you, who loves you, who redeemed you. And for us, in particular, it's against the spouse who laid down his life for us so that he could present us holy and blameless to himself and to the Father. And that's why, over the many, many generations, believers have found um, such a connection with the words of Psalm 51. Psalm 51. If you want to just quickly turn there and take a look at Psalm 51, uh, that, that powerful prayer of mourning over your sins. Just look at verse 4. The psalmist says, David says, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. That is the heart of, the, of a genuinely broken man. And that is the heart of someone who has now gained clarity really through their mourning to see their heart's true evil. When you mourn and you weep, whether externally or internally, okay, you will internally weep regardless of whether that happens on the outside. It's funny how those tears sort of wash away all the gunk of sin, all the stuff that's clouding your vision of the truth and of the beauty of God and of Jesus Christ and the the true evil of your hearts. You finally see it in mourning. Mourning is a, is a cleansing reality in that way. It opens up your eyes. And what you see is, you see is this, despite all his love and grace, 
you say, my heart is slow to mourn. It's slow to repent. It's slow to ask for forgiveness. And in fact, it's quick to sweep sin under the rug. It's quick to minimize sin, to justify it, to relativize it. It's quick to compare uh, my sins to other people's sins and take sins that are way worse than mine, according to my estimation, and make myself feel better as a result and, and, and sort of allow myself to tolerate and condone my own sins. You realize that the heart is slow to war against sin, to kill it, and it's dull about asking God for a greater hatred and rejection towards sin. And in the end, when your heart is genuinely broken like this, like David in Psalm 51 or Psalm 32, and you are crying out to God for His grace and His loving kindness and His compassion to blot out your transgressions, to forgive you and to cleanse you with the blood of Jesus Christ, what ends up happening is, 2 Corinthians 7, 9-11, to you will repent. You will turn. You will not be the same. There, there is a genuine turning away from sin on the inside, and therefore on the outside. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 11 says this. He says, um, For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So a fake repentance, sort of a surface shallow mourning, only produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. They cleared everything up with, in their conscience, with each other, with God. They, they, they went above and beyond the call of duty. And that's what repentance really does look like. There is no regret for what you lose out when you mourn over your sins and repent. You don't care if you have to lose money or a job or relationships or your reputation or even your family because being right with God and having fellowship with Him and is, is more important to your heart than anything else. You know that satisfaction is found in being with Him more than anywhere or anywhere, um, more than in anything or anywhere else. And there's no self-pity in that mourning. You're not looking back saying, well, I left this life behind. I'm going to have to lose this and lose out on that. No, there's none of that whatsoever. Also, there's no like rolling up into a fetal ball paralyzed by guilt and fear. Repentance is not being afraid of God in a terrified, slavish sort of way. The conviction of sin or true guilt leads to, leads to Christ. It leads to forgiveness. It leads to receiving His love and grace uh, for you in wiping out your sins, okay, in realizing that, that the power of the gospel is for that particular sin right then and there, no matter how entrenched that pattern of sin might be. And it results also, if you remember, if you look at 2 Corinthians 7, again, 9 through 11, it results in a zeal and a longing for personal holiness. It results in a desire to make things right. It results in a holy indignation, a hatred, and an anger against your own sins. It, it, it uh, leads to a healthy fear of sin because you realize sin is so deadly, so deceptive, so destructive. And because sin is so opposed to God. And so you mourn this way repentantly because of ultimately the one you've sinned against. It's not because of the consequences of sin or what you might lose out or anything like that. It's really not about you. It's because you've sinned against God, the one who loves you the one who forgives you, the one who cleanses you from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. And so, all godly mourning results in transformation so that you will, according to Luke 3, 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. A mourning heart will move on by faith, because mourning happens by faith. You can't just mourn on your own. You're mourning because you believe that you have sinned against God and sinned against Christ sinned against the Holy Spirit. Your heart is broken over sin. Only a person who believes in the gospel can, can have a heart broken like that. But once that happens, what else follows suit is a life of obedience driven by that faith-grounded mourning. In fact, there is no mourning over sin that doesn't result in breaking from sin. Not perfectly, but you will do whatever it takes to crucify, to kill that sin. 
practically in your life, there will be a turning. There will be new affections, new desires, new appetites away from one thing, sin, towards righteousness. Now, secondly, second Roman numeral, how can you mourn properly? Like I just said or alluded to, you can't mourn over your sins by just getting yourselves up into a mourning kind of frame. That's the same with poor in spirit. You must take your sins with you as you do the following. Okay? Now, these are not all... They're listed as steps, but it just kind of all happens at once, okay? And it's all by faith. Now look at this. Number one, you have to look at God. You have to look at God. What do I mean? Why? Well, because sin, as David says, is against you, against God. That's who's, every, you know, that's who's sin. Every sin is primarily against not man, although they are, but ultimately against the God who owns you, who made you, who owns your rights to the rights to you who owns the whole universe he deserves he demands justice and righteousness he is holy that's why he is holy in majesty holy in morality he is pure light dwells in unapproachable light he is transcendent in his inher inherent eternal glory and so we have to stand in awe of him at all times but especially when we sin we have to know be still and know that he is the lord we have to see him for who he really is as he's revealed himself to us. He is the creator to whom all the nations are but a drop in the bucket. He is a consuming fire. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And he is angry at sin and he is angry at sinners. Yes, he is. And he is perfectly righteous to feel this way. He's not angry at believers, but he's angry at sinners. And he's righteous to feel this way and to act out of that holy anger in judging sinners because he is perfectly, infinitely holy. If he weren't like that, man... That wouldn't be a just God. That wouldn't be God at all. In fact, He is so holy that only an infinite punishment accords with His infinite purity. So, when you look at God with your sins, you say, with, you say something like this with Job 42, 5-6. You say, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I've heard sermons on sin, on repentance, and holiness. I've heard sermons on sanctification. I've heard so many things on the gospel, read so many things on holiness and the gospel and sin and dealing with your sins. But now, but now I see you with the eyes of faith. I see your infinitely blinding glory. Therefore, I retract, he says, and I repent in dust and ashes. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm not going to rise up. No, I'm going to lower myself. And I'm going to say, I am a sinner. And I have sinned in these specific ways, Lord. And in these specific ways against you. And so know that your sin is first and foremost against him. And look at him. Look at him for who he really is. Don't minimize this step. Don't, don't treat this lightly. Yes, he is our father. Of course, he loves us. He's our Abba. He's not angry at us. He, he's not holding a stick over us. He's not going to get us. Okay, We're not going to lose our salvation, lose out on the, the, the eternal rewards that are in Christ like in terms of the fullness of our salvation, like somehow we're only going to be 80% saved if we sin too much? No, that's not the point. But the point is, the one that we sinned against is the holy God. Number two, then, cast your eyes and look at the cross of Christ. Now, what I mean here is the holiness of God, you see at, in, on the cross of Christ, the holiness of God in sort of pictorial form graphically right because on the cross jesus died because god is holy because we offended his holiness didn't we we sinned against his holiness and the only payment possible for that violation is a perfect one and so our substitute the lamb of god went up on a cross and was nailed there to death because we violated god's holiness and so because god is so holy infinitely righteous and just that was the necessary payment ransom price to deliver us from our bondage to our sins and to deliver us from the penalty of our sins so don't look at just jesus dying for you look at jesus dying for you because you offended the infinite holiness of god and to go with that look at jesus paying for each and every sin that you have committed are committing and will ever commit and realize this Take those things into consideration. Man, the holiness of God requires that kind of payment. And my goodness, Jesus died for me 
for each and every instance of my sin he's nailed there and then realize that in your sins that each of them is and to the degree that this sin is a long-standing one a pattern a, a habitual one one that you've not repented of ever one that you're holding on to but you know you shouldn't be holding on to one that you've treated lightly realize that each sin is a mockery of the cross it's a mockery of God's righteousness it's a mockery of God's holiness it's a mockery actually also of Christ's righteousness because only a perfectly righteous God man could hang there on the cross to pay for our sins against God realize that each of our sins is a trampling of the blood the precious blood of Christ realize that each of our sins is a grievous dishonoring of the one who spilled his life to save our lives for all eternity these are not just generic sins that Christ died for right they are my sins that's what a mourning person does a mourning person one who's weeping within those are my sins Jesus is dying for me up there Jesus is Jesus is dying for this particular sin I'm repenting of and confessing in this moment every single one of them including all the desires and motives and inclinations of the heart that are wicked he paid for all of that with his life and so the question becomes this how can I sin against him how can I spurn his agony for me so easily so flippantly do I not have a soul is my conscience still working at all? right? And if that goes on and on and on, and there's no break, there's no change, there's only hardness of heart, there's only a shallow repentance, there's only a trivial dealing with sin, be warned. Be warned. I don't say this lightly, but you need to check your soul. You need to examine your faith. Are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ? Because one who sees the glory of the cross and the wonder of that death for you will not long be in sin there will be a moment and a time where you will stop you will cease from sin and I'm not saying perfectly okay but you will repent of your sin you will want to kill your sin and you will take steps to do so on the inside and on the out number three look at his love his love the father's love the son's love both of their loves what put Christ there on the cross God's love for the world John 3 16 Romans 5 8 what put Christ on the cross was Christ's love also for us. Galatians 2.20, Ephesians 5.25, he wanted to buy his bride. That's us. Gaze upon that love for you. Right? Not only is it infinite holiness and righteousness being demonstrated perfectly on the cross, but it's infinite holy love being demonstrated there. Gaze upon that. Father sending his beloved son, innocent, exalted above sinners, free from any sin whatsoever. He sent his son. In the form of human flesh and he sent his son to die for our sins and the son laid down his life for us on the cross so that we could be his sheep and his friends and his brothers and sisters forever and ever the godly for the ungodly the righteous for the unrighteous why for eternal uh, for what purpose for eternal forgiveness for peace for joy for union with him and of course why does he do this for me what's so great about us and the answer is nothing is great about us he does this because first John 4 8 God is love. The only way we can respond to Him in love and respond to others in love is when we are filled with His love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is the one who pours out God's gospel love into our hearts when we believe, when we properly mourn, when we turn away from sin, when we confess, when we repent, when we realize in our heart of hearts, man, I am such a sinner and in these specific ways and you confess them to the Lord he fills you with his love so let the love of God so fill your heart that you respond to him in kind with a child's love that just wants to melt in the arms of their father they know that their father loves them so much cares for them so much is always looking out for them let his kindness lead us to repentance Romans 2 4 ask yourself in light of all of this, right, how can I offend the God of love? Right? That's what a mournful person, someone mourning over their sins, will say. And then you, you and I, we'll really have bitterness towards sin, a zeal for God's honor, and a real longing for holiness. The Puritan Thomas Watson, uh, in the book The Doctrine of Repentance, says that when two things are frozen and congealed together, the best way to separate them is by fire. 
So when sin and I are congealed together like this, the only thing that's going to separate me from sin is not my good works. It's not my effort. It's not my mustering up enough willpower to mourn over my sins and be poor in spirit and fight. But ultimately, it's going to be the blazing heat of God's love for me on the cross, demonstrated on the cross, that's going to tear my affections away from my sin. It's an issue of desire. It's not just an issue of behavior. Why do I do that behavior? It's because I want something. I'm looking for something. I'm desiring and longing and lusting for something in that thing that I'm going after, in that action that I'm committing, in that sin that I'm going towards. The blazing love of God will produce in me the, the, the affections that only a born-again heart has. It'll stir up those affections, I should say, right? It'll, it'll incite those affections. It'll increase them. It'll aggravate them in the best sense. When we realize He loves me, He loves me even though I sin like this, even though I've done it again, 70 times 7, He loves me, He forgives me. So it's not just the joys of heaven or the torments of hell or, or that will make me turn from sin to God. Ultimately, well, it's true, those things are important, but it's ultimately it's His love for me as the Father and, and, and Christ's love for me as my Savior and Lord that will awaken in me a deeper mourning over my sins uh, a, a stronger desire to forsake it, a renewed will to actually turn from my heart away from that sin to serve the true and living God. Now, thirdly, what is on the other side of mourning? What is on the other side? And for each of these beatitudes, there is another side, right? There is a, there is a, there is a blessing. And the blessing, the happiness comes in this, that when you mourn over your sins, when you truly are torn in your spirit over your sins, broken, contrite, you're trembling because of conviction of sin, and you repent and you come and confess and you receive His forgiveness in Christ, what do you feel? What do you get? You get comforted. You get comfort from Christ in that moment and you also have the comfort of Christ waiting for you forever and ever. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 talks about the comforts of Christ and all of our afflictions. Now, I know that, I think that's talking about physical afflictions there, but poverty of spirit, mourning over sin, that's a repentance, that's an affliction in the soul. Not necessarily because of external trials, but because of your own sins, right? You're afflicted in your soul. When you are afflicted in your soul and you take that to Christ, or you're afflicted in, soul, in your soul because of Christ, because you've offended Him, because you've grieved Him, you've hurt His heart, you're acting like a spiritual adulterer to your husband, then you will also have in that one fell swoop, it's almost hard to describe, but you will also have with that mourning, you will then immediately have the comfort and the feeling of being forgiven and the feeling of being loved and cared for and not having your sins imputed against you. You'll have joy. Repentance does lead to joy. I mean, all true repentance really is a joyful uh, repentance. Not a giddy one, not like you're smiling and acting like a fool. But true repentance leads to joy because true repentance leads to the comforts of the cross of Christ for your sins. That's why. In fact, if you have a joyless repentance, if at the end of your repentance you're just more, uh, more like morbid, more dark, more depressed, despairing, more doubtful and uncertain, that's not repentance at all. You're looking at yourself too much. You're probably looking at what you have to do, what you have to feel, how you need to like do certain steps in order to actually repent and for God to get on, you know, for you to get on God's good side. Don't do that at all. Remember all the different steps that we just talked about was looking at God, Christ, the cross, His love. It was looking outside of yourself. Once you're convicted of your sin, it doesn't help you to sit there and just look at sin. You need to look at your Savior. You need to look away from yourself. Look outside of yourself. If you keep looking at yourself, what's, what's going to end up happening is this. You are going to want to try harder not to sin. You're going to want to try to make vows so that you'll be pure and holy. And you're going to keep beating yourself up to ease your conscience and to appease a God whom you've now created to be so very hard to please. When the God of the Bible is not like that at all. Don't try to pay off your sin debts. That's not mourning. Okay, that's self-righteousness. That's pride. That is Catholic penance. And that will not do. 
anything at all to bring comfort to your soul. It will drive you into greater and greater personal bitterness, not over sin, okay, but personal bitterness because you will, you will never feel right with God and eventually you will come to hate Him. You will. Spiritual mourning, true spiritual mourning, will be met with God by cleansing because you're going to the cross. You're not going to yourself. You're going to the cross and God cleanses you with Jesus' blood so that your conscience is pure and your communion with Christ, that pipeline between you and Jesus is unclogged. Your sin is, is not counted against you. That sin is practically speaking. It's not there as a barrier anymore to your fellowship with Jesus as you realize, man, it's been nailed to the cross. And that's the comfort that we have now. But we look forward to an eternal comfort, right? A comfort in which all of our mourning will be turned to absolute joy. Can you imagine that? All the sorrow and sadness and mourning and brokenness over our sins will be gone in an instant when we see Jesus face to face, 1 John 3. will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15. All this curse of sin and the sorrow and the mourning and the death that sin produces in us and in the world will be eradicated. Not just partially, but completely. We'll be glorified. All the ravages of, uh, ravages of sin will be gone, inside and out. All mourning itself will be gone. We will never have to mourn for our sins any longer. Because death itself, the wages of sin, will be swallowed up by life, eternal life. For each and every single believer, personally, individually. Revelation 21, 4 promises this. It says that He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Note the intimacy of that image. Just think about God the Father wiping the tears of every single person who's sad and brokenhearted because of their sins and the, the sins that are just running rampant in this world, the sins of their family members, the sins of their nation, the sins of their people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will, be, there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Why? The first things have passed away. The old creation has passed away. The old is gone, the new has come. Now that's a reality for me, for you, as believer right now. We're a new creation in Christ. And what we are is the first fruits and a preview of what all of creation, the new heavens and new earth, are going to be in the ultimate regeneration when God recreates everything for his glory and for our eternal good and so i hope that encourages you and helps you that dealing with your sin is serious business it's not something to be taken lightly we have to be killing sin or lest sin be killing us according to john owen and that's so true sin is deceitful it's deadly it's insidious it's subtle and you know it gets inside of us in ways that we can't even imagine the schemes of the devil are numerous and they are very intelligent and smart and devious and they will they will try he, he and his minions will try anything and everything to do to upset our faith to get us off of our position in Christ now we can't lose our salvation but we can be made miserable can't we and so in dealing with our sins let's deal with them rightly let's deal with them decisively let's deal with them in the in the face of God who is holy and in the face of Christ who took our sins in the face of God who loves us in the face of Christ who is holy but who loves us who cares for us he cherishes us he nourishes us and when we when we see God and Jesus Christ when we see him truly as he is it will in fact bring us to a mourning of our sins and as we mourn and we see him again and afresh on the cross hanging there for those sins It'll bring us comfort beyond all measure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace of being able to mourn for our sins, the grace of repentance. You give it to us. And uh, as we do so, we're able to see ourselves clearly and we get to see you more clearly. In fact, the very fact that we, get, that we are mourning means that we, get to, that we are understanding our sins ourselves and you more clearly. But that is all because you open our eyes to see those things. You give us the conviction of sin through your spirit. And you help us hate our sins and fight against our sins and put them to death by the Spirit, not by our own willpower or strength. And we thank you that the grace of Christ strengthens us to repent and to mourn and to deal seriously with sin, not lightly. 
So help us, Lord, to have a holy hatred towards sin, to have a bitterness towards sin, because we see how it affects our communion with Christ. We see how Jesus died for that sin and our sins, and we don't want to hurt the heart, grieve the heart of the one who loves us. We don't want to get anything in the way of our communion and our joy and our relationship with Jesus. So help us to properly mourn when we do sin. And through that mourning, Lord, may we be comforted by the comforts of the cross of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.